Hey guys, today we are going to solve a popular coding interview question which is called the nth Fibonacci number. This is a very popular beginner question where you should demonstrate that you can understand and implement a basic mathematical problem. I will show you three different solutions that really let you shine in the interview. We will start with the simplest approach and then continuously improve our solution to get a faster code. I will also analyze the time and space complexity so you can practice the big O notation with me. If you like these kind of interview questions, please leave me a like and let me know in the comments that you want to see more of this format. So let's start. Here we have the task. So the Fibonacci sequence is defined as this. The first number is 0 and the second number is 1. And the nth number is the sum of the two previous numbers. So n minus 1 and n minus 2. And now the task is write a function that takes n as an argument and returns the nth Fibonacci number. And as a note, the first number 0 has n equals 1. So if we have a look at the Fibonacci sequence, then these are the first numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. So the first number is 0, the second number is 1, and then we have 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, and so on. And now we get the index, which is starting at 1, and then we should write a function that returns the corresponding Fibonacci number. So this is the task and this is a classic example where we can apply recursion. In a recursive function we call the same function again. So we call the function again with n minus 1 and n minus 2. So this is how our example looks if we start with the function Fibonacci of 5. So this is calling the function Fibonacci with argument 4 and with 3. And then again, fib4 is calling fib3 and fib2. And again, fib3 is calling fib2 and fib1. And here we stop because we know these are defined as 0 and 1. And then again, on the right side, we do the same. And then we can start calculating. So we start at the bottom where we know this is 1 and 0 and then we do 1 plus 0 equals 1. Then again here we know fib2 is 1 so we have 1 plus 1 is 2 and then we look to the right side where we know these right away so again we have 1 plus 0 is 1 and then we do um, fib4 is 2 plus fib3 is 1 so our final fib5 is so the Fibonacci number of n5 equals 3. Now if we go back and have a look here, then we see we have n5 and the Fibonacci number is 3. So this is correct. So this is the first approach we are going to use. So let's jump to the code. So here I have the example as a comment again. And now let's start implementing our first function. So we define a function and call this fib and this gets n as an argument. And then remember the first two numbers are already defined. So we can say if n equals equals 1 then we return 0. This is the first Fibonacci number. And if n equals equals 2 then we return 1. And otherwise we have to call or calculate the sum of the two previous numbers. So here we return fib and then n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. So this is exactly what we are seeing here. And this is the whole implementation. So now let's test this. Let's say our n equals 5 and remember the result was 3. So if we call fib3 and print this, uh, sorry, fib of n and print this, then we should get 3. So let's run this and we see that our result is correct. So this is the correct implementation and now let's analyze the space and time complexity of this. So I can tell you that the 
time complexity is big O of 2 to the power of n and the space complexity is big O of n and I will explain this in a second so let's have a look at this graph again and we see when we are starting and going down each time we call two more functions so fit5 is calling these two FIP4 is calling these two, FIP3 is calling these two, and so on. So each time we have two function calls, so 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, and so on. So that's why the time is 2 to the power of n, and the space is big O of n. And now you might be wondering why this is n, because here we are not storing anything. But this is to do with the so-called call stack. So if we go back here and have a look, then um, when we are starting here at the top and then we have to call these functions and then we have to call these functions and so on. And we still have to keep these calls in the memory. So we have to let them stay in the memory until we are at the bottom and at this position we might have n function calls in the memory. This is why the space complexity is n. And then when we start evaluating and returning these then we can remove this function from the call stack. So yeah, so as we see the time complexity here is not very good. So can we do better? And yes, we can. And one method to do this is to apply memoization. So let's go to Wikipedia and have a look at memoization. Memoization. So here we have the definition. In computing, memoization is an optimization technique used primarily to speed up computer programs by storing the results of expensive function calls and returning the cached result when the same inputs occur again. So this is basically a cache and this is exactly what we can apply here. So if we have a look at the graph again, then for example we have the FIP2 call here and also here and also here and we have the FIP1 call here and here. So all of these function calls occur several times. So once we did the first calculation, we can store this in memory and then return the result immediately. So let's apply memoization. So let's create a second function. Let's call this FIP2 and here we use memoization. So again we pass in n and then we also pass in the cache. So let's call this mem equals and here we are going to use a dictionary and as a key we use the index and as the value we use the Fibonacci number. So we can um, put in the first two numbers here right away. So we say our first number is 1 and or the first n is 1 and the first Fibonacci number is 0 and then the second n is 2 and the Fibonacci number is 1. And now when we get a new n we can check if this is already in our dictionary and then we can return it. So we can say if n in mem, this is how we check if a key exists in a dictionary, then we can return mem of the key n right away. And otherwise we calculate this the same way as we are doing it here and then store it as a new key. So we say mem n equals and then we call fib2 of n minus 1 and we also pass mem and then plus fib2 of n minus 2 and again we pass in mem. And of course we have to return this, so we return mem of n in the end and then this should be good. So now let's test this again. So let's print the first 
function and let's also print fib2 of n. So this should be the same result. So let's run this. And here, uh, I sorry, I missed the colon. So let's save this again and let's run this again. And then we see this is working. We get the same result. So now let's analyze the space and time complexity here too. So for the time, we get big O of N. And for the space, we also get big O of N. And um, so the N is still the same because of two reasons. So one is again, we have the call stack, which is keeping these function calls in memory. And the second reason is because we now have this data structure, which has up to n values. So O of n is our space complexity. And the time complexity is um, O of n. So now if we see, um, if we have already calculated one of those functions, we can cross all the other ones out. So each of those functions, we only have to evaluate once. So at the most, we are doing n more function calls. So let's test this if this is true. So let me copy these two functions and then here I have a new um, file where I paste this in. So let's keep track of the number of function calls. So we can do this with a global variable or a counter variable. So we say C equals zero. And then in here we say this is a global variable. And then we say C plus equals one. And then um, after our function call, we want to print. So let me grab this and let me put this here. And then let's also print C. So the number of function calls we did here. And then let's do the same for the next function with the memorization. So we set our counter back to zero. Then here we say global C and then, oh sorry, and then C plus equals one. And then here we do the function call and print C. So let's save this and let's run this. And then here we see we get nine function calls for the first one and only seven for the second one. So this isn't a huge difference, but now let's increase our n. So let's say our n equals 30. And let's remove this. So we want to use the same n. So now let's run this again. And then we see this is a huge difference here. So we see we have the same result. So this is working. And then the first time we are doing this many function calls. And the second time only 57. So this is much better, but there is an even better method. So let's implement a third way. And for this, we are not using recursion. So in this case, actually a iterative solution is better. So let's define a third Fibonacci. Let's call this Fib3 and this only gets N. And then we can use the same check as we are doing here. So if our n equals equals one, we return zero. And if our n is two, we return one. And otherwise we are doing a for loop. So we store the previous two functions or the previous two results, previous two and previous one equals. So the first time we have zero and one, and then we do a for loop. So we say for index in range, and here we start at n three, and we go up until n. So we have to say n plus one, because the last number is excluded. And then here we calculate our new Fibonacci and this equals 
the sum of the two previous numbers, so pref2 plus pref1, and then we update our numbers. So we say previous2 is now previous1, and previous1 is now the current number. So we can do this in one line with Python. So this is a handy way of writing this. So we say pref2 and pref1 equals pref1 and fib and then down here we return the current fib and this is it so this is the iterative approach so now let's copy this down here and test this function here if this is still working so let's also print fib3 of n and then we see we still get the same result. So let's test this for 17 and we see this is working. So now let's analyze the space and time complexity here too. So our time is still big O of n because here we are having a for loop up to the number of n. So big O of n for the time but for the space, our space is constant, so we have big O of 1 because we are only storing these two values here. So this is all we have to store, only two variables, so this is constant, so that's why we have big O of n. And yeah, so this is the best solution and now you know how you can implement this interview question and I hope you enjoyed this. If you like this, please subscribe to the channel and see you next time. Bye!